Okay, so um, cybersecurity, um, I won't say it's everyone's favorite topic, but it's you know, a hot topic. It, it sort of comes and goes, but it's, it's pretty much the number one, I guess, IT topic over the last few years. Um, but it, it very much concentrates, I mean, like there was a show in the UK now, you know, info security is all about firewalls and DDoS and ransomware, stuff like that. But um, so it focuses quite narrowly on the IT security solutions. But I'm, I'm just wondering, and I think you folks have coined this phrase, cyber resilience. Is, is that a more helpful way to look at the, the scale of the challenge rather than, you know, individual sort of point security solutions? Well, you know, one of the things we found talking to CIOs and CISOs all over the world is that storage is often not included. So think about it. When you look at the output from security analysts, not people in storage or IT people, or, you know, but guys who cover security, the average dwell time from the initial attack until it's resolved is over 200 days. So if you're protecting the edge, think of that as the moat with the alligators and of course the walls of the castle, then you're tracking the bad guy down. So that's the sheriff of Nottingham. And last time I remember the sheriff of Nottingham did not get Robin Hood very well. Um, and he pretty much was roaming free. So what you need is then inside the castle walls, your storage, your most valuable asset besides your employees, your data, you need to be protected. So you need to think of cybersecurity if you're a CIO or a CISO as a higher level and encompass everything. So storage, all your data is on storage, all of it. So if you don't have cyber resilient storage, you don't have a comprehensive cybersecurity strategy for your enterprise. And I'm guessing as well, I mean, I'm sort of fearful to stretch your analogy, but rather than one castle these days, we have a multitude of castles and, you know, if you like different buildings all need protecting, you know, a hybrid IT infrastructure, if you like, which is making the problem far worse. And I'm thinking to the extent that, um, I can't remember what point, but once upon a time I used to go to events and, you know, the idea was you could actually stop people, you know, successfully attacking your organization. I think these days people accept more or less that it'll happen. So it is more how you deal with it when it happens, as opposed to, yeah, as not that you won't try and stop it, but you have to accept that you probably won't, you know, stop all the attacks. Yeah, I, I think it's very clear that it's not if you'll be attacked, it's when and how often, right? They're going after you. Uh, these guys, if you will, are the next generation of criminals. So they don't use guns and knives and all the stuff you see in the movies. They use computers. And they know that you've got primary storage and secondary storage. And they know what they need to do to hold you for ransom. Obviously, malware is literally data destruction. So that could be either uh, someone hiring a criminal to do it from a competitive company. <clears throat> Obviously, governments have been doing it. It's been all over the news. Uh, yeah, one government's trying to erase, in fact, uh, recently, um, I forgot which country it was, but one of the attackers of that country was trying to erase all the data connected to their, their utility systems. So guess what? Then you wouldn't have been able to run the lights, the power, the, the natural gas. You wouldn't be able to heat the buildings. People wouldn't have had lights because they would have wiped out all the data relative to every computer that controls the you know, country's utility systems. So that's the malware side of things. And then, of course, you still have, you know, theft, literally old, you know, corporate espionage, if you will. The old days, of course, you, you get with the engineer and you, you know, buy the patents or whatever before they're filed. And then you as the competitor have those patents to the airplane or whatever it is you're trying to compete with. But now you just steal them or you get the IT guys to steal them. So it's both the theft of your um, materials, okay, whether you be in manufacturing services, your customer accounts, your financial information. So that's the theft side. The ransomware, of course, where we hold you for ransom and you know you can't get to the data, so you can't run your business. And then the malware, which could be clearly is happening at the governmental level because that's all over the news everywhere in the world, but could be something that could happen at the corporate level where one company is trying to you know, really fight dirty against the competition. So malware, ransomware, and what you've got to do from a, what I'll call cyber crime now versus a cyber attack. These are all really critical issues that the CISO and the CIO need to think about when they look at their storage. It's not, again, if you'll be attacked, it's when and how often. And as you said, when it's a global company with data centers all over the world, it's even worse because the attacks will come at them into every data center through their networks, you know, so the bigger the company, the worse it is and the more exposure points you've got.
And uh, just as a matter of interest, is it possible to distinguish, I mean, the volume of attacks seems to just carry on increasing. Is that just because we're, you know, as, as a world becoming more and more digital? Is it allied to that, the fact that, you know, during the pandemic and even pre that, you know, people are working many more different and maybe not as secure location. But how do you see that sort of landscape? So developing? this is, as you know, for the last 15 years, the world is becoming more and more digital. Okay, everything you do, both at the personal level, right? Pay your credit card or your mortgage online, right? You don't, you know, they take it right out of your bank account, which by the way, means your bank account number has just been exposed. If the mortgage company or the credit card company is attacked, they can steal your bank account information and empty your bank accounts, right? So, and then it's gotten worse uh, as that digitization has continued, it's getting worse and worse. The second thing, of course, is the rise of not only the multinational, but what I'll call the super multinationals. You can't pick up the paper without seeing company X buying company Y. So now you've got that many more data centers, but that often less people to protect them because usually, obviously, many times, unfortunately, there may be a downsizing, particularly in IT. Yet you may now have twice the data centers you had before because you just bought another company. Obviously, the pandemic and the work from home exposes additional entry points, AKA piggybacking on top of a legitimate employee of the company, right? And attacking that way. So the attacks, if anything, are not gonna go down, they're going to go up. And it's really critical that the CIO, and if they're big enough to have a CISO, right? The chief security officer to make sure that they're protecting what happens with all the people that are working at home what happens while well, people work at the office. So for example, I happen to use the Norton stuff. In the last two days, I have been attacked three times. So three times I've gotten a note, I've got the edge protection on my you know, home uh, MacBook Pro, and it's come up three times and giving me some weirdo address and said they're trying to access the universal control on your Macintosh. So of course I said block. So imagine you're a giant corporate entity and you have 200,000 employees you got data centers in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. So you have attack points into every data center, attack points between the data center, and attack points around those 200,000 employees. And my example is just me in the last three days, the last three days. And, you know, Norton's really good for the home computer, but imagine that exacerbated by 200,000 employees, then five or 10 data centers all over the world. So that's why it's this whole move to a, a more digital economy, which has been going on really for 15 years, if not 20 years. And then the exacerbation of that by COVID with so many people working remote, that has changed the ball game even more. So um, the, the sort of focus on cyber resilience, I mean, I, I know the IT security space, I mean, depends on you know, how granular you want to get, but there are tens, if not hundreds of different categories of IT security. But then we've got other things, you know, like risk management, which is a broader topic, and there's cyber insurance, which I know people sort of argue about. And then we've got data, data protection, where I guess was an early attempt to try and bring maybe storage and security together. Uh, and, and, on, and then there's obviously the storage. So I'm just wondering, I know it's very difficult to pin it down in a, in a short time frame, but, but how wide do you think the cyber resilience you know, strategy needs to be? What, what does it need to incorporate? So it needs to be very comprehensive. From a storage perspective only, you need all your primary storage and all your secondary storage. So your back secondary storage would be your backup data, your archive data. Obviously you replicate data because of fire and natural disaster, right? I'm coming to you live from Silicon Valley. We really do have earthquakes. They have earthquakes in Japan. You saw just the other day, there was an earthquake in Afghanistan. So all those natural disasters, you're replicating the data as well, right? So that to me is all, secondary data sets, replica snapshots, backup and archive, okay? Then you've got your primary data, the day-to-day -day data you're using to run your corporation, finance, manufacturing, support, service, sales, marketing, every function of the company is completely digitized these days, right? I mean, as you know, in many of the large, large companies, when they build a car or build a plane or build a boat, half the stuff you see when you see the you know, the video is robots doing it. Well, guess what? Those are all controlled by computers. So that's all the digital world. So if you don't add to the edge protection, to the tracking the guy down, to security you do at the application level, the storage, you're leaving exposed 
every stitch of data in your company because all data in your corporation ends up on storage connected to your server farms. So if that's not protected as well. So you need a comprehensive strategy that incorporates everything. And it's tough, right? When you're big, you have a, you know, usually a chief security officer. If you're medium sized, you have a, a, you know, a CIO for sure. And he may not have a CISO, but he sure better have one or two people, right? Some man or some woman who knows enough about security to take, uh, if you will, a comprehensive view. Think of it as, as we would say in the States, the 50,000 foot view. So what is that? Like the 20,000 meter view, right? You gotta be up here looking down and saying, ah, okay, over here's a city, over here's a town, here's the highway, here's the train tracks. Oh, there's an airport over there. You know, think about it as mapping. So you need that up high level to map and then plan around how you're gonna do the security across everything. But storage is often forgotten by whether it's the CISO or the CIO, yet every stitch of data in every company, whether you're big, whether you're medium, or whether you're small, sits on your storage, yet you don't protect it from a cyber attack and don't have the cyber resilient storage. That, that's a mistake. So that's why a comprehensive strategy incorporates everything that you said, but also must incorporate that physical infrastructure aspect of your storage environment, because all your data sits on your storage. And I'm just wondering, I mean, as we, we were chatting before we came on air, um, you know, we've both been in the storage industry for a while. Um, and in terms of silos, they always used to be a, you know, a major stumbling block between everyone sort of doing what was best for the company because they were maybe protecting their own little area, whether it's server huggers, um, you know, the network folks and stuff. Is that still an issue or are we getting more sort of collaboration across departments, which is, sounds yeah, like it's so very, very necessary for this? What today, what you're seeing is the overcomplication of the data center, which makes the cyber resilience and cybersecurity even more commonplace. So. You know, one example would be to consolidate storage. Over 50% of all storage, according to storage analysts and IT analysts, over 50% of the storage isn't even utilized. So, you, and I'm not saying, yes, you have backup, yes, you have, but I'm, when you look at every aspect, primary storage, backup, archive, snapshots, replicas, 50% of all the storage companies buy is underutilized or not used at all. So item there, you're managing more. Second thing is you can often take that and simplify your data center dramatically by consolidating storage. So for example, we have a customer, in this case, they happen to be um, in Africa. They're a utility company servicing multiple countries, like 10 different countries. They're the largest utility firm in Africa. And on the backup side, they had 14 physical devices to help with the backup. We came in with a product we call InfiniGuard and we went from 14 to two devices. So A, Going from 14 to do cuts your capital expenditure, cuts your operational expenditure, cuts your operational manpower, which I'd argue is a, is a subset of OPEX from a cost perspective, but the manpower is managing the storage and not doing other things. You also have 14 items that you're trying to do cybersecurity and cyber resiliency on instead of two. We have similar examples on primary. So one of the things you can do is consolidate those storage silos cutting your CapEx, cutting your OpEx, reducing your operational manpower, and at the same time, make it easier to execute a cybersecurity strategy. Because instead of protecting 50 different storage arrays, you're protecting five or 10, which is easier all around. And so data center simplification is something that not only can affect the budget aspects of a data center, but actually can really assist in the day-to-day um, use of the data by the end users, right? The employees of the company, but also can dramatically enhance the cybersecurity strategy because now you can protect it more easily. You're, you're spreading that protection, uh, not across 50 different storage arrays, but again, across five or 10, which is easier to do everything, easier to secure, easier to monitor, right? So there's a big, big effort now in many of the global Fortune 1000s that they need to be consolidating their infrastructure. And by the way, they're doing the similar thing with servers and networking. Right. If they can consolidate the servers and networking, it helps not only reduce costs, but again, you know, the servers can get attacked and the networks can get attacked. So from a cybersecurity perspective, shrinking the number of physical assets, A, not only makes it easier to work with the data, not only reduces the cost of all that infrastructure, but makes it easier to secure and monitor the security of that infrastructure because you're not monitoring as many things, as many physical devices. And that, that is something that can really help from a cybersecurity strategy. And in terms of um, of that strategy, I mean, clearly the backup, you know, sec 
securing the data is very important but as we sort of discussed earlier things do go wrong and when they go wrong you may need to then rely on that backup to, to recover in a, in a decent time i can't remember again once upon a time it was if you weren't back up and running in was it 72 hours your business was probably you know finished or whatever and the, and the costs are, are you know, astronomical um so do you think again there's a are people maybe complacent they think oh i've got all my backup in place great and they either don't test it enough or when unfortunately the day arrives when they need it they realize it isn't perhaps as um rapidly you know deployable recovery wise as they thought so is that an important angle people need to to consider so yeah when you look at the secondary storage such as your backup storage or your snapshots which is often used as a adjunct or replacement for a backup strategy malware and ransomware can attack that too right no one is beating their chest saying i'm going to do malware on you or i'm going to do ransomware on you they're not standing there like King Kong in one of his movies, pounding the chest about how they're gonna do it. So it's all done on the sly. Think of the guys who do ransomware as essentially James Bonds or Jason Bourne. I mean, some famous spy in a book and they're all doing it secretly. So that does mean that you could be backing up malware ransomware without even knowing it. So you need to, and you wanna create things like an immutable snapshot and then you need to do a recovery. So what you really want to do is, one, do the regular backup on a regular basis. People lose data all the time. Data gets corrupted. So you would want to do that regular backup to, to keep that data protected just from day-to-day -day operations, even if malware and ransomware didn't exist. Okay? But malware and ransomware do exist. So in addition to doing it to keep that data always available in case there really is human error or really, you know, data does get corrupted periodically on primary storage, it's not doesn't happen a lot now and many products like our Infinibox can automatically recover from a data corruption event and do it autonomously and automatically, um, but it still could happen, right? So you need that backup data set. Then you wanna make sure that that backup data set also has cyber resiliency and cyber security in it. So you wanna make sure you're creating an immutable snap, which means it can't be altered. You want to make sure you've got a lot, what's known as a logical air gap, which separates the management plane from the data plane, because a manager creates the logical air gap. Once you create that logical air gap, for example, with our InfiniGuard and our InfiniBox on primary, but our InfiniGuard for secondary backup storage, once the admin creates it, the admin can't delete the snapshot either. Okay, and if someone more likely steals the credentials of the backup administrator or the storage administrator, they can't delete it because you've separated the management plane from the actual data itself, right? So the manager controls it, but once they say immutable snap, what we, what's part of our InfiniSafe technology, they can't alter it. Then when you do have an attack, you want to create a fenced environment, a fenced area to do forensics. And the reason you want to do that is, again, no one's pounding their chest saying, I'm holding you for ransom until they really do it. So you don't know what data sets are impacted. So you take that immutable snapshot that's been air gapped and you put it in a fenced forensic environment and you test it. And then if it tests good, you, what, what's referred to in the backup world as a known good copy, known good copy, you then restore that back to the primary storage and the primary server. So that's sort of the process you want to go through with the backup data sets that for us is our InfiniSafe technology. And that happens to come on our InfiniGuard uh, backup appliance and that software actually is, at, is free. It's embedded in our license. So when you, you don't have to use it if you don't want to, but when you buy an InfiniGuard system, you don't only get all the backup stuff that it can do, but you actually get the cyber resiliency software at no charge. It just comes with the system. It's a, if you will, it's a checkbox item, a very important checkbox item, but you get it for one license fee. We don't charge extra for that. Some other people do charge extra, but again, it's all about protecting your data. So you need to protect it from a regular basis, okay, regular backup, but you also need to add cyber resilience to that backup. Remember, the cyber criminals are smart. If I hold you for ransom and all I've done is, is do the encryption on your primary storage, all you have to do is recover from a backup data set. So they're not dumb. They, they know that people do backups and archiving and snapshots and rep, replicas. So they know they not only have to control whatever primary storage they want to hold you hostage for, they need to control the backup and archive and secondary data sets of that data because otherwise you just go backwards, right? You'll just, as you said, you can restore a backup. And you know, so if they don't hold it hostage to it, you, they can't be a very good criminal. And, and in terms of the, um, the sort of the, the consequences of, of, of something going wrong with an organization, I'm just wondering, I mean, once upon a time people were 
pretty much, you know, I won't say our age, but, you know, if, if you, you suffered an attack, your organisation, that was very bad news. I'm just wondering, is that still the case? Or are people slightly more empathetic? Because, you know, we, as you say, you, you had three attacks in the last 24, 48 hours. We all are aware of them. And are we more forgiving? Or is, are people, you know, customers, organisation, if they think their data has been compromised, pretty much, you know, they're going to be off somewhere else. How do, how do you see that? So I would say they are way less forgiving. As the world goes digital, your SLA, your personal SLA, if you're doing business, so if I'm buying from an Amazon or some online store, uh, Google did a survey a couple of years ago, one, two. That's how long you'll stay on a website if you don't have a response back, one, two, okay? So obviously, if that's a purchasing website, and you've had malware and ransomware and that website goes down, one, two, oh, it's not working. I'll go buy that sofa from somebody else. I'll go buy that book from somebody else. That's how it works. On the business to business front, unless you're in a monopoly situation, if you go down, there's all kinds of other people that, that make widgets, that make factory equipment, that make computer storage. We're not the only vendor that does computer storage. So if we can't respond, they'll buy from someone else. Even if the product's not as good, you know, sometimes you can't wait. So if anything, the digitization that's gone on in the last 15 years has made the downtime even worse, whether that be from malware or ransomware or true, just traditional downtime, the storage or the servers went down, right? So that's why many companies um, on the server side, you know, it's all redundant. Our storage is all redundant. In fact, for us on our storage side with our Infinibox product, the primary storage product, we offer our end users 100% availability guarantee that the storage will always be available. So whether it be a traditional failure, people are less, less uh, willing to be accommodating. And if it's for malware ransomware, it's uh, too bad they got malware ransomware. Oh yeah, I saw it in the newspaper the other day or saw it on, on my online news report. But you know what? I need that sofa if I'm an end user or I need that that widget to build my machines, I got to go to the different widget guys. So if anything, digitization has made the impact of cybercrime that much more impactful because they're, everyone's online now. If you, you know, 20 years ago, if, if you were the only guy with your widget online, then they might be forgiving. But if now the 50 widget manufacturers across the world are all online, and let's assume 15 of them are good to very good, then if, the, if you're the best and you can't buy, they'll buy the second best because otherwise their factory shuts down. So everything is on such a real-time basis due to digitization that the impact of a cyber attack, malware, ransomware is actually worse than it was 15 to 20 years ago. Okay, and then moving on um, to, to Infinidat yourselves. I mean, as, as we've gone along, you've, you've given us some examples of, of, of your solutions, what they do, but can you, can you perhaps give us just a summary of, of you know, the level one level sure. two so yeah what it is that you offer and how that contributes to this cyber resilience um, landscape sure so our focus is on enterprise grade storage we provide both primary storage and secondary storage the primary storage is our infinibox family our secondary storage is called the infiniguard family these are very high-end solutions things like 100 percent data availability uh, very high performance um, ideal for consolidation. I gave you a real world example in the backup space in Africa. We have a number of other customers all over the world in the UK and Germany and Japan and the US where they've taken 15 storage arrays from someone else and consolidated down to one or two infinite boxes, which gets down to not only cutting capital expenditure, operational expenditure and the manpower, but obviously making it easier to do cyber resiliency. Now, from a security perspective, what we've done is this year, we introduced our InfiniSafe technology. Our InfiniSafe technology is focused on cyber resiliency for storage. That's what it does. It doesn't do cyber resiliency for servers or for networks. It's a storage-centric product. And it we have it both for primary storage on our InfiniBox family, and we have it for secondary storage on our InfiniGuard family. And there's really four legs of the stool of cyber resiliency in the storage world. First is an immutable snapshot, immutability meaning you can't alter it. And there's a whole bunch of things around that, like not letting the admin delete it, you know, all kinds of things you need to do when we have that. Second thing is this logical air gap that separates the management plane from the data plane. Again, give you an extra level of protection. You know, if, the, if you're doing it on the InfiniGuard, so that would mostly be a backup admin or an archive admin, 
and that admin's credentials get stolen, if the management and data plane are separated, it doesn't matter that I just stole your credentials. If I try to hack in, I can't get to the immutable snap because I've separated the management and the data. The forensic environment, we talked about that is another thing you need. And then clearly it's about recovery. People are not forgiving. Again, that Google study one, two. So the faster you get your systems back up and working, so the recovery aspect, net, you have your known good copy, how fast can you recover? On the InfiniBox, our primary storage family, we can recover in a couple minutes, one, two, maybe three minutes worse to recover and make the data available again. On the backup side, we can recover in 12 minutes. And we actually have a live demo of that actually um, when we launched our InfiniSafe technology back in February of a live data set, the backup vendor we partnered with was Veeam. So their software that executes backups. And we recovered 1.5 petabytes, which is a lot of data, 1.5 petabytes, but it could have been 10 petabytes in 12 minutes and 15 seconds. That is a live demo, obviously recorded now, but we literally did it live in February. So that recovery. So those are the four things you need from a cyber resilient storage environment. And we provide it on primary storage with our InfiniSafe on our InfiniBox and with secondary storage, our InfiniSafe on our InfiniGuard. So that's the kind of things that we do to enhance the cyber resiliency of your storage estate. And at the same time with our other features, as I mentioned, try to dramatically cut your costs and quite honestly, dramatically simplify your data center. The easier your data center is, the easier it is for you to save money, the easier it is for the constituent end users at your company to get to data and utilize the data. And of course, as we've been talking about at the beginning, really with a focus on cyber resiliency and cybersecurity, it makes it easier to do cyber resilience and cybersecurity for you, right? And so that's a real, the advantages of, of how we approach things with our you know, high-end enterprise class storage and the features we have, whether it be the primary storage or the secondary storage and how we've woven in this cyber resiliency. If you don't have storage with at least those four legs of the stool, then you are not, your, your storage is not secure and it, it, it won't help you with your corporate overall cybersecurity strategy. You're, you're leaving a gap on the storage side and you don't want to do that. And in terms of your customer base, I mean, clearly you've, you, you'll have some customers that have been with you quite a while, more recent ones. Are there any particular key reasons, whether the ones you've you alluded to as we've been chatting or whatever, that people knock on your door and say, I've got this problem, or as I know, obviously, lots of organizations have their own unique circumstances, but are there some common themes, if you like, running you know, the reason people come, come to you and, and ask to, to yeah, see your I, solutions? I, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. So first of all, how the, our end users think about us is actually public data. So one of the leading analyst firms, Gartner, does what they call their peer insights review. These are end users, vendors cannot participate, press cannot participate. So you or I could not write a review of Infinidat and they validate where it comes from. It is blind. So for example, you'll see VP of technology, right? And they'll leave the name out. Um, and as they write the reviews and for the Infinite Box and the InfiniGuard, we have over 500 end user reviews. So these are real customers. Um, they rank it on a scale of five, five being the highest. So our in, we have th three ratings. We have our InfiniBox, which is 4.9 out of five. Our InfiniBox All Flash, which is an all flash array, that's five out of five. And our infinite guard for secondary storage is rated 4.8 out of five. So you can't do much better than that. And that's from real end users. So now why do those end users rate us the way they rate us? And by the way, we've been a leader in every Gartner Magic Quadrant. And we're the only company that is not multiple billions of dollars that's a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, by the way, the only small company. Um, so our customer base tends to be, it is absolutely global. It does, it is concentrated with global Fortune 500. Uh, for example, in the Fortune uh, 50, 25% of them use us. Now, remember, we're a small company. I mean, we're not that small, but we're way smaller than all these other companies. Yet, 25% of the biggest companies on the planet use our technology. And there's a reason for that. So, first of all, is the simplification of the data center, the ability to consolidate and deliver enterprise class feature sets, our 100% availability guarantee. 
If you talk to the storage analysts, they will tell you our performance is unmatched by anybody. And I don't mean, you know, I've been in storage for 40 years. I'm almost 70 years old. So there's lies and damn lies. And storage statistics are definitely the damn lies. So we encourage our customers to do their testing with Oracle, with SQL, with Mongo, with their accounting database, with their manufacturing database, with their support and service database. So in those real world scenarios, our customers have pointed out to us that we have been anywhere from 50% faster than our competition to as much as seven and eight times faster than our competition from a performance perspective. Why does that matter? What that means is the SAP workload that took two hours now takes 20 minutes. It means that uh, on the backup side, for example, one of our customers, which is in Europe, in the telco space, one of the largest telcos in the world, they had some very large backups of Oracle data sets. They were doing backup um, and it took two hours to back up a 10 terabyte Oracle database. They put it on our InfiniGuard product and now they can do that exact same backup in seven minutes, two hours to seven minutes. So that's the performance side. The other thing which is noted heavily in these end user peer insights is what we call the white glove service. So we are very high-end centric. Uh, every customer not only has a systems engineer and a solutions architect and a sales guy and those of our channel partners, but we also provide what we call a technical assistant, a technical advisor, excuse me. And the technical advisors are assigned to every account in the world. They're not a tech support person. Their job is just to advise them. And then of course we have technical support. So in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, for example, they, they highlighted that our support and services head and shoulders above the companies that are bigger than us. So we take a very, very customer centric approach. And in fact, because we put inside of our technology, what's known as AI ops, we can actually pre-diagnose problems. So in some of our public references um, on infinidat.com, as well as in these peer insight reviews, people are saying, a, that InfiniBox has been sitting at my place for two to three years and it just does its thing. I, I don't have to manage it. It does it all on its own and it's working great. We had other customers point out that, wow, we had a bad power supply. We didn't even know about it. But InfiniDat did. So InfiniDat called us, InfiniDat sent us an email and said, hey, the power supply in InfiniBox XYZ is down. We need to replace it, blah, blah, blah. So we have proactive AI ops-based support and service built into the actual product itself. Um, and things like the data corruption issue I mentioned, we can diagnose that and fix it without on our own. Now you can go into the GUI and get a list of everything we fix, but the point is we fix it without human intervention. So though, that's the reason the performance, the white glove support and service with this built-in AI ops technology, as well as the humans that are around our support and service, and then these high-end enterprise features like the unbridled performance uh, and the um, capability of leveraging that performance to dramatically simplify data centers, cutting CapEx, OpEx, and operational manpower. So that's why people reach out to us. And we do have customers that are not global fortune 1000. You know, we, we, we have more customers in that higher end, but we've got government agencies all over the world, including counties or um, towns, cities, as well as, you know, country governments, national governments. Um, we have mid-sized customers. We're very strong with mid-sized and small cloud service providers, managed hosting providers and managed service providers. Many of them are public references on infinitat.com. So we're very strong with that, those cloud providers um, because things like 100% availability to them, that's a big deal, right? They make their money by selling a cloud service, right? Storage as a service, backup as a service, infrastructure as a service. So if it's not available, the guy will take his money and go to a different cloud provider. And then obviously the ability to do the level of data center simplification saves them money, right? They're in the business to make money. You use their data center to store your data or back up your data or have your you know, server infrastructure really using their servers. So for them, if you they can save money on that, either A, they're more competitive. And again, remember, this is the mid-size and, and so they're competing against Amazon and Microsoft, they don't have those resources. How do they compete? So anything we can do to make their data centers and their data center operations more efficient uh, is why we're strong with that group of, of customers. Those are the reasons that people reach out to us. 
Okay. And in terms of the the way they can reach out to you, the channel is obviously an important part of that of the supply chain. Um, and I'm just wondering back to our sort of original sort of cyber resiliency. Do you think there's an opportunity for channel companies, obviously working with yourselves, but to, to sort of claim this, if you whether it's a new or expanded, you know, rather than just talking about IT security or storage, to frame this cyber resiliency conversation and then obviously to provide the the, the necessary solutions. So yeah, in fact, um, on June 7th, I presented in the UK, um, it was at some racetrack, I forgot where the heck it was, but it was a racetrack. And we had an event where people went racing after, but we had about 15 channel partners across the UK and probably 15 end users there all learning about cyber resilience for storage. We walked through our InfiniSafe technology, what it does and what it do, can do. From a channel partner perspective, it's an adjunct Many of them are already doing the edge security. And now that's like, oh, wait a second, I could do cyber storage security as well. Oh, it's wait, it's built into my InfiniBox or my InfiniGuard, so I don't have to do much. I need to learn how to execute and how to help do the recoveries and how to consult. But the box does most of the work on its own, right? Our storage systems do the work on their own. They're autonomous and they're heavily automated. So you don't need the admins to do the work when you're talking the end user. And the partners just need to sort of understand the level below that to help the end user. So whether it be from a channel partner perspective, it extends what they're doing in the security world. Um, it allows them to have a comprehensive strategy, not leave something out, which clearly means that they're really advising the customer appropriately at the end user level by giving the real story. Okay, you got the edge, you're covering the servers. What are you doing to protect your storage? Are you, you, you know, you have to protect that too. All your data from your company is on your storage. So you might as well protect it um, and make sure you can recover it. Cause you, it, again, it's not if you'll be attacked, it's when and how often. And one of those attacks probably gonna get through. So having that cyber resilient storage is a critical aspect of that. So the partners can really work heavily with the end users. On the end user side, it's, it, it is, not a question. If you're not doing it, you really are making a mistake. Cybersecurity, it, it's so diversified as you pointed out earlier, right? There's the risk management asset, there's a physical aspect, there's the software aspect, the attack on the Oracle database or Mongo or Cassandra, or the attack on your containers, whether you're using Red Hat or VMware Tanzu or do your own Kubernetes. In fact, um, if you're familiar with the National Institute of Standards, and technology, which is a US thing, they actually have a dedicated document. It's almost 70 pages long on how a company needs to incorporate cyber secure storage into their cyber. And it's from the, the United States federal government. It is a global standard. NIST is something that's recognized not just in the US, but all over the world. And you know, working with that NIST framework is an important aspect of what a CISO or someone who's an expert on cybersecurity would do. So whether that be at the end user level or at the partner level. And remember, many of the partners today do have a cybersecurity strategy, or I should say a cybersecurity practice to help their end users. The issue is it often doesn't include the storage. That's the, the, where the gap is. So partners can fill that gap and have a true comprehensive element when they talk to an end user. And then the end users need that cybersecurity strategy from a storage perspective. Otherwise it isn't really covering all aspects of their data center and their business. And maybe just just finally for those end users that have um, whether it's you know, watching us chat today or just more generally they're becoming aware of this sort of wider cyber resilience and I would say opportunity or imperative we perhaps better better off calling it and um, where do they need to I mean is it possible that someone in the storage department or in the security department can lead it or does it need to come from somebody probably you know on a sitting on a board somewhere and say we need to have this comprehensive track. I just, just you know, one or two pieces of advice to people that are ah. you know, want, wanting to, to set right. about this. How, so I would go? say, yeah, I'd say it goes up and down an organizational level. So let's take an example. Um, Fortune magazine, you know, the business magazine did a survey. Um, and in 2022, this year, cybersecurity was one of the top five issues CEOs said was their problem. The leading, uh, one of the leading IT analyst firms, not for storage, but well, for storage too, but for everything. They did a survey of public board of directors. And this was February of this year when they surveyed public board of directors. So people who are on the board, not the CEO, not the CIO for sure, but literally on the board, 82% said cybersecurity was one of the top two issues facing their publicly traded company. 
So that's way up. If you're the storage admin or the backup admin, part of it is, I hate to say it, but you will look like a hero. <laughs> in the case of our stuff, our cybersecurity is built in. It comes when you buy the Infinibox. It's just a checkbox item. Now it happens to be a very important one and other people, when you get their storage, don't include cyber resiliency. Some are very weak on it. Some have some stuff not as good as ours, but you have to pay extra for it so they can look good. From a CIO perspective, you know, again, having done this for so long, I've never met a CIO who used to be a storage person, not once, anywhere in the world. I'm sure there has been one or two, but I've never met one. And I probably met with 500 CIOs at least in, all, in my 40 plus years of doing storage. So they don't really know, but the point is they do know they need cybersecurity. So having a, a comprehensive strategy means the app level and all the infrastructure level, and what I'll call the middleware level, the containers and the, and the VMwares, you need security at all those various levels. The CIO understands that and the CISO understands it. So you know, when you're looking at cybersecurity overall, it really is a top to bottom. And if I'm at the bottom to the mid layer, making sure that my storage fits in with that strategy is a really smart thing. And that obviously if I'm the CISO or the CIO, leaving storage out could be a huge gap. I mean, we've got customers just on our storage, not even their total storage, but just on us, 200 petabytes with Infinite App, 200 petabytes. And those companies that I'm naming, while we're their biggest storage supplier, they use three other storage people too. And the high end, it's very rare for these big companies to only use one storage company. We wish they would, but they don't. And like, I, I, you know, I have been the, the chief marketing officer of IBM storage and a senior VP at EMC, two of the biggest storage companies in the world. And they still didn't always use our storage when I was at those companies. So it's just not reality. So you, you need to make sure that it's across your storage infrastructure, I need this. And the good thing is that we provide both the primary and the secondary storage with our InfiniSafe technology that delivers what they need. So I, I think really at the top level, including non-technical people, the CEO and the board of directors, as I pointed out in surveys are saying cybersecurity is important, which means the CIO and the C CISO at the upper level, if they wanna look good to their board of directors or the CEO, it's like, here's my comprehensive cybersecurity strategy. I got the edge, I got the core, I got the servers, I got the networks, I got the storage, I got everything covered. And here's what I'm gonna to do to prevent malware and ransomware. And that makes the CIO and the CISO look good to their boss, which is usually the CEO, and to the boss's boss, which is the board of directors if they're publicly traded. So it's an up and down thing, and everybody benefits from this. Everybody, the storage guys, the infrastructure teams, the security teams, the CIO teams, and clearly up at the corporate level, the CFO, the CEO, and the board of directors, they're really concerned about cybersecurity. It is the number one way to attack a company these days, right? Okay, I mean, that, that's brilliant. I've, I've taken up a, a lot, probably too much of your time. So I'm really grateful for that, Eric, and, and for the insights you shared. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much. And again, it's not if you'll be attacked, it's when and how often. So every all of your listeners, anyone who listens to this you know, after, uh, they really need to think about what am I doing to secure my data? And that involves a very comprehensive strategy. If you don't do it, They'll figure out a way to get you, and that's not what you want. I, you know, one of the storage adages, uh, you know, for my for years and years at the end user level is, if you lose that data, you will lose your job. So malware ransom or malware, you do lose the data; they erase it. Uh, cyber criminals, they steal it, and if they find out it's because you didn't have the right secure storage, you'll lose your job. And clearly ransomware, if the ransom is really big, it's like, well, did you do anything to prevent that? Well, we didn't really have cyber resilience storage. You're out, right? I mean, they pay the IT teams from the CIO down to the lowest levels. They pay them to keep their data safe. And that's in all levels, right? The data on the servers, the data run through the apps, data run through networks, and all that data eventually sits on storage, right? So it, you got to protect all those levels. And I think that that's a critical thing. It's not if... It's when and how often, and that needs to be what everybody in IT is thinking about. And how can I make that how often not be successful, right? That's the measure to not be, to not let the cyber criminal be successful. Okay. Well, as I say, thank you very much indeed for your time, Eric. It's been great. Thank you. Great. Thank you.